Hi, everyone. Welcome back to part two of our webinar series on the workforce incentive payments for DSPs. Uh, my name is Brian Cox from the New York Alliance. Um, you may recognize myself and my partner on this series, Anthony Ishmael. We did part one a couple of weeks back, and we are here for part two. And for our guest in part two, we have Tom McGrath from Boston Spa National Bank um, here in the Capital Region, who was nice enough to grace us with his time. And Tom's going to talk a little bit today about, you know, some best practices related to the workforce incentive payments. He's going to address some of the frequently asked questions that I've received. And I'm sure, Anthony, you've, you know, dabbled in a little bit as well. Um, so Tom's gonna, Tom is gonna answer some of our questions and we'll go through similar to uh, what we did in part one, but we're really gonna focus this session on uh, the best things to do with your money. Um, I know everybody's different, but there are some best practices out there and Tom's gonna address some of the um, questions that people have um, brought up in the meantime um, as these payments are going out the door. So um, Tom, do you wanna say anything off the, um, off the intros? Yeah, well, so I guess first and foremost, I appreciate the opportunity to come in and address some questions. I'm a certified financial planner professional. So re really in terms of, of today, a lot of the questions that have come in have really been about what I always like to say is the financial foundation. So hopefully today, this will give you some, some good opportunity and, and some good information to help you make some better financial decisions down the road. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, Tom, so much. So let's get right into the question, shall we? The first question that I wanted to address is, um, you know, best practices, right? So, and when I say I, in this instance, I mean eligible DSP. So um, when I receive these bonus amounts, what are some of the things that I should think about when I get the money? Yeah, so I, I would say first and foremost, this is a great opportunity really to take a, a deeper dive at the current financial situation. Um, you know, with the idea that how do I make it better, right? So this is a great one-time event. Um, so look at where things are currently. So what are my assets looking like now? Do I have a good handle on that? How about on the other side of the balance sheet from a liability standpoint? How am I with credit cards, uh, loans, car loans? Do I have personal loans? Um, what does my emergency savings look like? Um, further along that vein, you know, if you do have some debt that's out there, um, is there a way that you could pay some of it down to keep borrowing costs or the interest expense down? And, and also thinking a little bit further, you know, within the next 12 months, for example, will there be any large expenditures that will be coming up? Um, do I have the money already for that? Do I need to put a plan in place to be able to cover that? Again, this I think is a great time to be able to, to do some uh, housekeeping, so to speak, in regards to finances. And you mentioned credit cards, Tom. So credit cards typically charge on average anywhere between 15 and 25% interest. And that interest, and correct me if I'm wrong, is charged on your balance that you carry from month to month, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point, Ryan. So what ha what's happening there is interest is accruing on interest. So if you are carrying a balance, it's not only the purchases, but it's also the interest that's been assessed as well. So it can you know spiral out of control very quickly there. So so I would say if, if you know from a prioritization standpoint, if there are balances on a credit card, this may be a great opportunity to pare some of those down so that you're in essence not paying as much out in terms of, of expenses and, and certainly you could redirect it, you know, to something else that will accumulate value versus mm -hmm. decumulate value. Hmm. Awesome. Got it. So the next question, a lot of the payments that are going to be going out are going to be delivered to DSPs within the next three to six months or so. Are there things that DSP should focus on initially as opposed to more long-term? Kind of give me a little bit of a prioritization. Um, sure. there. Yeah, yeah, a absolutely. I, I think this is a good question. It's, a, it's really a good follow-up question to the first one there. And I think, you know, when we think about a windfall of money, it's a moment to pause and, and think about, well, wait a second, what are gonna, what are gonna be the tax implications? So I think certainly that's a, a key thing to think of first, but then also tying into what I was saying, uh, you know, in the, in the first question there is, what about debt? You know, this is a great opportunity to, in essence, pay down some of that debt. Speaking specifically in regards to the taxes, 
you know, taxes can be a pain point for all of us. And, and most of us uh, listening in or on the, on the call today are not tax experts. But, you know, generally speaking, if we want to approximate here, if somebody is in a 20% tax bracket and receiving $20,000 as a bonus, it may make some sense to carve out $4,000, 20% of the, the, excuse me, 20, yeah, 20% 20 of the $20,000, totaling $4,000 to ensure that you've got a reserve, right? So sometimes what can happen when we have a windfall of money coming in, we wind up moving into a higher tax bracket, which we call bracket creep, where we have a progressive tax system in this country, meaning the more you make, the more you pay. So sometimes having these windfalls pushes you up into a higher bracket that you may not necessarily have been planning for. So, you know, keeping that in a separate account where it's not part of the ordinary everyday checking account where you're paying your household, bill, household bills, put it in something different. It could be at another bank, uh, another account, something where you know it's going to be available. And, and as I always say, financial decisions don't have to be made on the spot. While this, uh, this, this bonus money that's coming in is happening within a short period of time, um, our, our financial planning is really a continuum. So think through actions. It doesn't have to be done all today. It, you, can, you have an opportunity to pause and, and make decisions as you go along. Great question, Tom. Um, you mentioned tax bracket. How do I find out my exact tax bracket? That way I do not get into trouble with the IRS if, yeah. say, I receive $20,000 in bonuses. Sure, sure. So I, I think a couple of options there. So if, if you're more of, of a self-service channel or doing it on your own in terms of taxes, irs.gov, they will have the tables available there, which will show where you fall marginally. Or it may be the type of situation where ask for some help, you know, ask your tax preparer if you're not doing it yourself and, and get a feel for, hey, if I had an extra 20,000 or 10,000 or 15 or whatever the number is, how does it have an impact on my taxes? Should I be planning additionally for something else? You mentioned in the beginning of your answer, I think, Tom, that it was best practice to have, what, three months of savings um, built up? Yeah, yeah. Generally speaking, I would say three to six months. Uh, personally, with my own clients, uh, I always encourage at least six months. Usually, we target six to 12 months of cash on hand or emergency savings just to cover the what ifs or, you know, in essence, self insure against the what ifs of life that do come up. That's great. Of it, great of it. You had mentioned, sorry, paying credit cards down um, in your intro. If I pay off all of my balances, will that affect? Uh, my credit score. So yeah, so so credit is a credit is an interesting thing in this country. You know, you have to use it to to have it work towards your advantage. Interestingly enough, um, so so with that said, using too much of it is also a danger. So if you rack up too much credit card debt, it starts to have a significant impact on your borrowing costs. Because what happens is, if you have too much debt out there and not enough income to support that debt your credit score may wind up going down, which then of course, if you were to apply for a new loan, for example, or it could even be other things like car insurance, um, it, it'll have an, a negative impact. Um, so again, credit is, credit is a huge thing and certainly keeping up on expenses and loans and payments definitely helps along the way. Good question, I, mean, I didn't even think about how that could you know, affect your credit score um, going, yeah. going down the road. Uh, switching gears a little bit, um, you know, this is a lot of money um, that's going to be coming in the door, especially with regard to the longevity and retention um, bonuses. We've heard some people talk about um, putting away money for child's college or relative's college. What are the options in investing in um, college education? Sure, sure, sure. So it, a lot of times what you're seeing now are, are college savings accounts, the, the, the current version of what you see predominantly are called 529 accounts. And 529 accounts are accounts especially set up to save for college. Um, they're done in a more tax favored way, meaning what happens as long as the, the, the account is ultimately used for tuition, room and board, uh, certain mandatory fees of the college, the earnings will come out um, on a tax-free basis um, and possibly a double taxation uh, benefit there. It's regardless of which state's 529 you use, 
There is uh, no federal tax due. If you use your own state's 529 plan, it also oftentimes is exempt from the state taxes as well, or your own home state's um, income tax. So um, they can be very powerful tools to, to save for uh, college-related uh, expenses. Specifically, New York, um, there's two options. Um, there's a direct option, which is a self-service option. It's www.nysaves.org, and that's N-Y-S-A-V-E-S.org. And there's also an advisor-guided program, which uh, may be available through um, any of the participants' uh, banks or financial advisor um, network that's, that's out there. Uh, one thing I will always, you know, kind of keep in mind there is, you know, oftentimes these accounts are set up with good intentions, but life circumstances may not necessarily allow the individual that it's that it's set up for to go to school. So what happens if the money is not used for college, right? So let's say that, you know, let's say there's a full scholarship and uh, there's there's no need to have this 529 or use the 529 what'll happen there is the earnings come out on a taxable basis. And then there is, a, there is an additional penalty. Typically it's a 10% penalty on top of that if it's not used for college related purposes. I will say the one good thing about 529s though is that if it's set up for you know, the first, uh, first child or first student and is not used, the beneficiary can be changed to a, closely, a close relative. So there perhaps is a sibling could be a grandchild. So there are some options where it may exempt uh, from that uh, adverse tax implications that can happen. Thank you. Um, I, great I, explanation. Yeah, I was gonna ask what happens if uh, what happens if the child doesn't go to college or gets a I know Anthony's planning on all of his kids getting scholarships, so it uh, might not be a might not be an issue. For a good plan, <laughs> especially with the um, cost of education today. What about, and we've heard this a little bit too, Tom, what about 401ks and 403bs? Those are retirement accounts, right? Yeah, yeah. So 401ks and 403bs are common, common plans, workplace-sponsored retirement plans. Um, they're known as salary reduction plans, which is a fancy word for meaning the funding has to come from your payroll only. <clears throat> can't take money from your savings account and add it into a 401k or a 403b. Now, with that said, there are some uh, provisions available, assuming the employer allows it. If you had money in another 401k or a 403b, you may be allowed to roll that over or move that into a new plan. Um, but that's, that's more of an exception. You, you can't take uh, money sitting in a bank account and, and write a check to the 401k provider, it'll get rejected and, and the money returned typically is, is what, will, what will happen there. So, so save a little bit of aggravation. What I can say though, is that you know, with these plans, there is an opportunity to save quite a bit of money. So currently the, the, there are contribution limits, annual contribution limits up to $20,500. Uh, if you are over the age of 50, you have the ability to do what's called a catch-up contribution. The catch-up contribution is an additional $6,500. So maxing out for individuals um, up to $27,000 if you're over the age of 50 um, into, into these plans. Um, with that said, as a best practice, um, a lot of companies nowadays offer matching contributions. If the employee puts money in, the employer may also put money in um, that's free money. So take advantage of, of any opportunity out there where the employer is going to contribute on, on your behalf. Good. Tommy had mentioned 529s and other states. What if I have a child who's living in another state and I want to make um, the 529 contributions, but I live in New York State? Do I still get the tax credit? So it's, it's really more about... Um, so where the child is a, a well, so there's, there's two parts to your question uh, overall. So if, if you are making the contribution to a New York state plan, there may be some eligibility for a state tax deduction for that contribution in. Um, with that said, if, you, if the, the, the child or the beneficiary of the 529 lives in another state, um, that's a different set of circumstances where they may be taxed differently as a resident of say Massachusetts, but the account was set up as a New York state plan. 
So if the beneficiary is out of state from the um, grantor, so to speak, or the person contributing to the, the plan, it's a best practice, I would say, to think about where that child is going to reside. It doesn't matter where they go to school. It's more of a residency question of where they're going to live and which plan may make more sense for, uh, for setting up. So we talked about paying down debt. We talked about um, college savings. We talked about retirement planning through 401ks, 403bs. What if I wanted to invest in the stock market or mutual funds or something of that nature, Tom? What are my options there? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, generally, what I would say first and foremost there is uh, make sure that the here and now is going well, right? So first and foremost, ensure that the day-to-day -day is secure before investing any, any large sums of money. Again, going back to one of the other things we had talked about just a few moments ago, again, putting the, fun, the financial foundation in place, three to six months minimally of living expenses on hand, keeping that into an account that is not subject to any market fluctuations, is liquid and available whenever you need it. You know, again, preferably, as I said, my, my bias skews a little bit more conservatively there. Six to 12 months is typically what I encourage most folks to do, especially given anything can happen. I mean, look what happened a few years ago in terms of 2020 and coronavirus and how things had shut down. So, so it's a good way to help prepare for that. So with that said, once you do have the here and now secure, it's an opportunity to assess, right? So as I said earlier, uh, finances are a continuum. Decisions don't need to be made on the spot. Um, they can be thought through. And I think that's another best practice to take forward or, or carry forward is to do just that. I usually encourage clients of ours to, in essence, at the end of the year, evaluate where things are. So, you know, rather than making the commitment part, you know, partway through the year to invest, keep it in an account. And then at the end of the year, say, OK, here's where I am. What do I have upcoming next year? What do I need to think about if I have a surplus now? It gives you some green light or gives you a green light to say, OK, I may now be able to consider investing. Now, with that said, if it's if your time frame is under five years, I wouldn't invest. If it's greater than five years, it's an it's an exercise in saying, okay, is the risk associated with it uh, okay for me? Meaning, is the intended outcome worth it? You know, there's an emotional and, and obviously a financial uh, significance to investing money. We oftentimes hear about the ups or the downs. Uh, it's a you know it's a roller coaster in a lot of cases. So. You know, preparing yourselves and working with your advisor to make sure that you can afford those ups and downs and that it's not affecting your, you know, your day to day. Um, you know, one of the other creative ways you could also look at investing money may be in the form of, you know, using this temporary bonus that's coming in and uh, contributing, or excuse me, living off the bonus and contributing more towards your 401k or your 403b. So, for example, you know, if you if your goal is to uh, deposit ten thousand dollars into your four hundred three b plan, and there are um, you know ten month you know or ten paychecks left to the remainder of the year, a thousand dollars from each paycheck would go into the four hundred the four hundred three b there, so that you can get to get to your target. Um, and again. It oftentimes ensure that if there is a match on that contribution, please take advantage of that. And those contributions are on a calendar year basis, right? That's what you mean by uh, stretching it out over those 10 months or the- those it, I'm sorry, yes, I did, yes, good, good point there, yeah. So at each, each January 1st, the clock does reset in terms uh, of contribution limits. Um, now, what does happen or what periodically will happen uh, the contribution limits will increase, or they have been increasing. So presumptively, come January 1st, 2023, we may see an increase again, where that 20,500 may go to a, a, a new number, or it may stay the same. So, I mean, there have been plenty of years where that has happened as well. So let me, let me ask you one, one last, go ahead, Anthony, go ahead. Yes, sir. Tom, you mentioned um, four or three B contributions and the amount. As a professional, is there any formula that you recommend to your clients in terms of allocation, like a money market fund, a balance fund, international fund? Like what percentages? Is there a specific formula that you would recommend to your clients to invest that money in their sure, 403? Sure. That way they maximize returns. 
Yeah, I mean, in, in generality, everybody's situation or everybody's financial situa situation is a little bit different there. What I can say in generality is the younger the individual or the further that individual is away from retirement, typically they can afford to take on some additional risk. So they may be more skewed towards riskier investments like stocks versus someone who is closer to retirement age where it may be more conservative. But with that said, there may be circumstances within that individual situation where uh, they, they're making a different decision based on perhaps other money elsewhere or perhaps uh, just their personal situation. They don't want to take on that much risk. So it, it would vary based, you know, on a case by case basis. But, you know, in general, I would say the longer somebody's time horizon, it does present uh, clinically anyway, that they can uh, afford to stomach a little bit more risk, so to speak, on, uh, on investing. That makes, that makes sense. Yeah. One last question from me, Tom, and I think yeah. you've kind of gotten to these points probably in, in some of our previous questions, but just as an example. So I have a mortgage, I have two car loans, I get um, my pay, my bonus payments and I wanna put those towards paying some of that debt down. What are some of the considerations that I should make just in that example of the mortgage, the two car loans, traditional um, situation? Yeah, so that's that's a good question there. So 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 really I would say that's that, that's an exercise in looking at how much am I paying in interest expense there? Typically, unsecured debt like credit cards is presumptively going to be much higher than a secure, you know, a securitized loan like a mortgage where it's backed by the actual house there. Um, and, and I would say in that situation, Ryan, absolutely going towards the credit card would be the first recommendation there. Um, you know, if that interest rate is, I don't know, 15%, let's say, um, by paying that down or, or accelerating payments to that, you're giving yourself a 15% return on that money just by not having to pay out the interest expense associated with it. Because I want to pay less money in interest and more toward the principal, right? That's, That's exactly. Okay. Pay, pay it down. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, things open up, right? So, so when you have less money going to your debt service there, uh, it, it, you can redirect that money, whether it be to an emergency savings or perhaps more towards retirement or a non-retirement investment account. Uh, but it just gives you more opportunity to invest in uh, theoretically or, or appreciating assets over time is what we're looking for versus depreciating assets over time. Thank you so much. One last, Go ahead, Anthony. Last question. One last the floor. Point. Yeah, last question on mortgages. Um, we know that interest rates are going up. So for persons who receive a lump sum, would not be a good time to consider refinancing. Yeah, so, so the, the question there, generally speaking, or as a general rule of thumb, uh, we, we've been, you know, we've been fortunate that the last, what, 15 years, we've been in a, actually even longer than that, maybe 20 years now, a very low interest rate environment. So a, a lot of folks have um, refinanced a lot of those, but generally speaking, I would say is if the current rate is about 1% less than what your current rate is on a mortgage, look to see if it makes sense. Because what is going to happen is you're going to have closing costs associated with refinancing a mortgage. So it may or may not work. But generally, if, if there's a 1% difference in the interest rate, um, there, there may be some benefit there. Or perhaps what you can do is refinance to a lower term. And then ultimately, it's about paying less on the overall mortgage as well. So uh, you know, definitely, uh, if I had to prioritize again, you know, credit card over uh, mortgage, credit card first, and then look at the 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 mortgage, um, it, the the mortgages are amortized, so they actually have a more favorable impact on your credit than the revolving or the credit cards do. Thank you, Tom. Well, Tom, I just wanted to say thank you so much for recording this webinar with us. We really appreciate. Um, all the insights that you've given, you know, some of the best practices and, and answers to our questions. Um, really appreciate your time. So thank yeah. you so much. Thanks for having me. And, and just Thanks one thing well, that we Tom. didn't, one thing that we didn't touch on in this webinar is um, benefits, public benefits and how that will, how this money will impact your public benefits. Anthony and I will be back for part three of our webinar series um, sometime in the future with a public benefits um, expert to kind of talk through those, talk through those scenarios, those questions, kind of same format that we went through here with Tom um, with a public benefits expert. So stay tuned for part three. Thanks again to Tom McGrath from Boston Spa National Bank here in the Kappa region. 
Um, and I hope this was helpful for everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.